I generalized the title a little. I'm going to talk about medical research because that's what's wrong with the literature is that the research is uh, not so good. I'll uh, describe to you some of the problems and one of the problems, of course, has to do with statistics and I'll do a uh, parlor trick. I'll show you how uh, you can be uh, confused by how statistics is stated and then I'll show you how you can get your uh, mind straight if, if the problem is presented well. And then I'll go through a uh, article in the medical literature uh, claiming that red meat causes uh, diabetes and uh, if you needed further proof that that doesn't make sense, I'll provide that. Okay, so uh, medical research. Well, there's a lot that's wrong with it. I'll just list uh, on the screen some of the things that uh, one could say about it. We've heard a few other things today about what's wrong with it. I didn't say this. I doubt that I would say it in print in a medical journal. This is from uh, Richard Horton, who is editor-in-chief of The Lancet. So if things are really that bad, uh, he uh, published a famous editorial uh, describing a symposium uh, in which he said that uh, much of the scientific literature, maybe half, uh, may simply be untrue. And it's, of course, a little surprising since if it's bad, uh, he was, it was on his watch. Lancet is very important, but he's not the only one. Probably the most famous critic is John Ioannidis, who similarly uh, said that the PPV exceeding 50% uh, is not right. The PPV stands for positive predictive value. And what that means is uh, when you, if you come up with a number and you compare it to uh, what is the true number by some independent method uh, th uh, that it's true. So what, what went wrong and who's to blame? The experts are saying the literature has 50% errors, uh, that 50% is not reproducible. So nothing's really being done. So is this okay? Why isn't something being done? So I'll tell you a joke. So a guy goes into the grocery store and says he wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. So the clerk says, I can't sell you a half a head of lettuce. And the customer says, uh, sure you can, go ask your manager. So he goes in the back to see the manager, doesn't notice that the customer is following him. And he says to the manager, there's some jerk out there who wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. And then he sees the customer and he says, and this gentleman would like to buy the other half. Uh, <laughs> The problem is that they're talking in generalities and uh, they're not naming names. So, of course, if you say that the literature is half bad, everybody thinks it's the other half and they're doing everything okay. So uh, I'm gonna try to describe some of the problems that we have and uh, statistics is at the heart of the matter and the hard idea to understand is that statistics is our servant, it's not our master, and statistics per se is not directly part of science. There is no F equals MA. There is no core observation from which everything emanates. If you do statistics, you're making assumptions. You're, you're, you're uh, uh, proposing an idea. And if the st statistics is good, it will line up with your sense of, uh, of the science or your sense of the biology. But by itself, it won't tell you the answer. Group statistics in, in particular hides information. Uh, everybody knows that averages mislead. Uh, my favorite uh, example is still, I got this from Paulus's uh, uh, popular book on statistics. The average resident of Dade County, Florida is born Hispanic and dies Jewish. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can't use that as such. And relative values, are equally misleading. So if, if uh, Alice has 30% more money than Bob, is she rich? Well, you don't know. They may both be on welfare. Okay, so uh, my point here is that statistics should be simple in the sense that uh, 
an idea I want to project to you is that you understand statistics. You know, you know, uh, you, you're familiar with certain things that you do in your daily life, and when they make the statistics too complicated, you should be suspicious. So uh, everybody knows what probability is, uh, at least once uh, you pointed out to them. They know that the probability of winning a game is the ways to win uh, divided by all the possible ways. So the probability of drawing an ace, you have four aces, is uh, four out of 52, or 0 0.077, or you can describe it as you have a 7% chance of drawing an ace. The probability of drawing the ace of spades, however, there's only one of those uh, in, in the deck, and so the uh, probability is 0.019. Odds are similar, but uh, slightly different. The, the odds of a, an event are the ways of getting that event divided by the ways of not getting the event. So it, it's the ways of winning divided by the ways of losing, so that, for example, the odds of drawing an ace uh, is 4 over 42. 48, because uh, the aces are not counted. So it's very similar to the uh, probability. Wh where I'm going with this is I'm uh, trying to get you, I'm going to use all of the odds and probability uh, measurements as equivalent, because in the situations that I'm going to talk about, uh, they really are equivalent. Now, the odds ratio is the key thing, because the odds ratio, uh, the odds of uh, drawing an ace compared to drawing it, the ace of spades, you know, is, is what, what is your chance uh, if you needed an ace or if you actually needed the ace of spades it is four to one. You have four times greater chance of pulling an ace than you do uh, pulling the, exactly the ace of spades. But notice what's, what's changed here. You lost some real information because I calculated the original odds on the basis of a deck of cards. And if you go in with this information uh, uh, to a blackjack game, you're going to be in trouble because you don't know uh, the actual odds. All you know is the relative odds. If, if, the, uh, if the casino is playing with four decks, uh, the odds ratio is the same, but the actual odds are going way down. And relative risk is similar. Uh, that uh, risk uh, is the same as probability, and those are similar. Now, what I want to tell you is that hazard ratio in what we're doing is the same thing. It's actually the odds within a fixed time period. But uh, again, for what we're doing, it, it doesn't matter. So that's what I'm just telling you. So an odds ratio of 1.5 means that you got 60-40 in your favor. And, uh, but as we said before, the odds ratio doesn't tell you about uh, your real odds. So good benchmarks that people always use is uh, Bradford Hill's study of uh, smoking and uh, lung cancer. And your chance of getting lung cancer if you're a smoker compared to a non-smoker is 20 to 1 and it's 30 to 1 if you're a heavy smoker. So uh, we're going to try to deal with something in literature. Because what, what I'm going to tell you is people ask me, uh, I'm an editor, uh, I was the editor of a journal, and I review a lot of papers. What, what do I look for in analyzing a scientific paper? Uh, well, first of all, I look for the pictures. Uh, <laughs> they're, of course, called the figures. but. Uh, I think if you can't make a, a picture, something's wrong. So the conclusion they got from this is that red meat consumption, particularly processed red meat, is associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. But before you read ha their case, you have to know that statistics is not a science. What I said at the beginning is that you have to bring in your knowledge of the biological system. And uh, if, it, if it, the statistical result violates your biological experience, you better ask for very strong proof. If you say you can jump over the chair, I'll cut you a lot of slack. If you say you can jump over the building, I gotta see, I gotta see you do it. So the bottom line is that the best statistical test is the eyeball test. If it looks like crap, it is crap. And this is uh, a uh, 
figures showing that, that uh, red meat consumption went down drastically, real numbers, and the uh, uh, rate of diabetes went up in the last 30 years. So it's unlikely that they are uh, correlated. So let's try to deal with the paper uh, on their terms. Let's look at the statistics. So this is what you see when you look at these papers. And uh, it's a little discouraging. There, there are three, uh, three separate groups called cohorts. And they're broken up into, uh, uh, each group is broken up into quintiles. That means you know they, they take the people and order them according to red meat, and they put them into five groups progressively. But, but you look at this, I have the same reaction that you do, and that is that uh, uh, they're trying to snow me. Okay, you gotta tell me what's going on here. So I'm gonna do the parlor trick. And there are uh, at least a half a dozen people did this on YouTube. And I'm going to do it again because it's, uh, it, it's great. It works uh, pretty well. And, and it's actually the result of an experiment as described here. Physicians were presented with a problem, and uh, they mostly got the answer wrong. So I'm going to give you the, present the problem to you. So the probability, this is a mammogram uh, test, and probably the woman has breast cancer. Uh, is 0 0.8 percent. That's the incidence of breast cancer. If a woman has breast cancer, the probability is 90 percent that she'll have a positive mammogram. The mammogram's an accurate test. If she does not have breast cancer, the probability is 7 percent that she still have a positive mammogram anyway. So if, if you want to think about that and see if you can figure out what is the probability if she has a positive mammogram that she actually has cancer. And, and most people, uh, including most scientists, have pretty much the same reaction to this. It, it hurts your head, and you uh, are surprised that you can't figure it out, even though you did the same problem a week before. So uh, now I'm going to show you that you can actually deal with this problem if it's stated in a uh, more direct way. So the same data were presented to the physicians in the following way, and then they mostly got the answer right. So eight out of every thousand women have breast cancer. Of those eight women, seven will have a positive mammogram. This is the same data as previously. Of the remaining 992 women who don't have breast cancer, about 70 will still have a positive mammogram. So again, if a woman has mammogram, what is the probability that she actually has breast cancer? Well, the technique that I'm going to recommend is uh, widely taught to, uh, if not universally taught to medical students. You make a two-by-two two diagram, and uh, is there a pointer? Anyway, the, uh, you can look. The vertical columns uh, are whether you uh, uh, the number who have cancer under different conditions and, uh, uh, or don't have cancer. And the uh, uh, horizontal tells you whether they got uh, tests on the mammogram. So where the, where the, uh, e each individual subdivision is where the, the uh, uh, boxes, uh, wh where the lines cross, so the upper uh, left-hand corner will be those who have cancer and also a positive mammogram. So let's fill out this thing. We, it says that of a, a thousand women, eight have breast cancer. So that's the total there. Now seven will have a positive mammogram of those eight. So that goes into the box with positive mammogram and cancer. And, and one is the difference. Of the remaining 992, that, uh, that, those are the ones who don't have breast cancer, uh, so they're in the, the uh, right-hand uh, column. Seventy will still have a positive mammogram, and of course, uh, 922 won't. So uh, what, again, I'm going to ask you what the probability is. And I think you can see that uh, you may even be able to do it in your head right now. Positive mammograms, well, seven true ones and 70 false ones. So the total of 77 positive mammograms. 
true positives are seven, so the probability, what, what's called the positive predictive value, is just seven over 77, or nine percent. So in the, in the original case, a lot of the physicians guessed very high incidence of uh, cancer, but the actual rate given a positive mammogram is nine percent, which is uh, surprising. Uh, the numbers actually are, are uh, pretty accurate for the real world case, so no, no no oncologist would take action on the basis of a mammogram uh, by itself. So, uh, in, in doing this, what, what, I'm, uh, gonna, what I'm trying to do here is I'm going to show you the diagnostic test method. Works easily, you can make it logical, and you can more or less, uh, I, I know it's a little hard in a lecture, but you can uh, more, logically, uh, more or less logically find the answer. And I'm going to try to apply that to that cohort study on red meat. But you, you need to know that in addition to the positive predictive value, that's the real payoff number, you also want to know the sensitivity. You know, is it a good test? And of course, the mammogram is a good test. It has 88% sensitivity. And specificity refers to the true negatives uh, over those who don't have cancer. And that's also very good. Now, high specificity means if you don't have a positive mammogram, you're unlikely to have cancer. Of course, even if you do have a positive mammogram, you're unlikely to have cancer. But uh, it's important to know those numbers. So this, it's a sensitive test, but when you have a low incidence of disease, uh, you're going to have trouble uh, analyzing the uh, statistics and finding risk. So you've got to be very careful. So now we're going to ask, is high red meat consumption diagnostic of type 2 diabetes? So we're going to try to pretend that eating red meat is, uh, is like the diagnosis test and that the payoff is, uh, is now going to be type 2 diabetes. So we're back to this thing. Uh, now, they had, uh, we're going to restrict ourselves to one of the cohorts, one of the groups that they looked at. and they. Uh, had 37,083 men. So we'll uh, put that as the totals in the corner there. Now, here's that mind boggling uh, table again. And we're just going to look at one of these cohorts, which is called the Health Professionals Follow Up Study. And again, what they did is they took all, all the people in this cohort, they uh, determined how much meat they had, and they ordered them and then lumped them into five different groups according to how much uh, meat they had. Already there's some problem there because uh, they've averaged and taken a uh, group statistic. So you don't know, especially at the high end, whether there's somebody who could really chow down a lot of red meat, biasing everything. But we'll take it at face value. So this lists uh, three of the cohorts, the lowest red meat Q1 and the highest red meat Q5. And uh, so we're going to look, uh, look at the data. This table tells you how many people are in it. Uh, and so we can put those over there. Now, the, the, what we want to know is how many people got sick. I mean, how many, uh, this is actually uh, uh, retrospective, how many people got cancer. And uh, one of the problems with these kinds of papers is that the data is moved around. You have to go to a second table. Uh, but now I'm telling you what to look at, so you can do it if you want to. Uh, and it lists cases and person years. Now, cases is what you want to know. Person years refers to uh, a, a different method of analysis. So uh, it's the number of uh, people times the uh, time, but it, it's irrelevant for what we're doing here. We're going to keep it really simple and just look at it as an odds ratio. Well, 655 people in the big red meat study uh, uh, got uh, type 2 diabetes, so we, we, and 6592 didn't. So we already got what we want, uh, the probability, which is coincidentally 9%. So this is not compelling. I mean, this is uh, uh, d uh, different than what they were selling us in the uh, abstract in the journal. And uh, I, I won't go through this. We just fill in all the other data that we uh, would get. Uh, these are all in either table one or table two. 
So what does it mean? Well, what it means is the first thing we found is that the positive predictive value is low. It's 9%. So that's not much. But the question is, is it, is it zero? In other words, uh, if, you get, if you have a cohort group and 9% of them got sick, well, they always say you can scale that up to the entire population and you'll save uh, 100,000 lives every year. That's only true if it's good data. And uh, to, to get a sense of what's, uh, uh, what to compare it to, if you look at the people who, got, who ate very little red meat, it's 47%. Now, the absolute difference is what you really want to know. And that's already 4.3%. And that's pretty low. And then you have to stop and ask, where does this come from? And it comes from food frequency questionnaires. And without going through all the different criticism of food frequency questionnaires, how much meat did you eat last year? Uh, you know that whatever the accuracy of that is, it's not in the range of 4%. However, <laughs> you could take the ratio, uh, and that would be equivalent to an odds ratio of 4.3, the difference between the two over the 9%, which is the risk in the uh, target population, and that would give you an odds ratio of 0.48, and something you see on uh, uh, in your inbox will say, new study shows almost 50% reduction in risk. Well, that just doesn't mean anything. And again, the positive predictive value uh, is uh, discouraging. The specificity is quite good, and that means that uh, if you don't eat a lot of red meat, you're unlikely to develop type 2 with diabetes. Of course, even if you do eat a lot of red meat, you won't. <laughs> So uh, I'll make my own picture. So if you, if you just took people, uh, everybody in the group that had diabetes and just lumped them at random into uh, five piles, you'd get something like this. Uh, you get something like the dotted line. The red is the actual uh, uh, positive predictive value. And you see all these positive predictive values are very small. And the difference between random and the positive predictive values, uh, it may be a real number, but it's really like uh, weighing the captain by weighing the ship when he's on board and when he's not. It uh, has no accuracy. So they adjusted this uh, to c c because they came up with uh, real numbers uh, better than uh, 9%. And if you do a study, for example, showing that uh, carbohydrates, uh, cutting out carbohydrates will make you thin, you have to correct your data for the total calories to make sure that's not the controlling variable. So you would take your data and subtract out the effect of calories and then, uh, then see if it still held up on carbohydrates. Well, they've corrected for a lot of things. Family history of diabetes, history of hypertension, total calories, dietary score, whatever that is, and shirt size. No, they didn't correct shirt size. Uh, one point in passing is that mathematically, uh, a confounder is symmetrical with the original data. So if you correct red meat with smoking, you might just as well correct smoking with red meat, and that might actually make more sense. So uh, let, me, let, let me explain something about this. I'll tell you a joke about confounders. So the, the woman calls the police because the guy across the street is exposing himself. And the police come, and the cop says, lady, that window is too high. I, I can't see anything. And she says, sure, where you are, but stand on this chair and you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you have to do this much work to come up with an odds ratio uh, of 1.5, it's not real. So uh, this is some of the, uh, a couple of the things that are wrong with the literature, and I refer to them as the four horsemen of the statistical apocalypse. 
And those are group statistics, which uh, again averages things that can't be averaged. Relative risk, which I just showed you doesn't make sense. And uh, at this time, I'll run through what's wrong with a meta-analysis. And uh, intention to treat, I can't talk about here, but if you look it up, you will be surprised at how bad it is. So what is a meta-analysis? Well, what it is, well, I, just, I described it with the old joke, meta-analysis is to analysis what metaphysics is to physics. Uh, <laughs> but but basically, the, basically, the idea is that if you have a, a group of uh, studies, if you think they're really similar and you average them, you hope that they'll uh, uh, come out giving something that's more reliable. One of the things uh, that I pointed out, and uh, uh, we heard this earlier, if you look in the literature to see what's going on, I, I, I'm trained as a uh, chemist. And I've worked in a number of fields, including behavioral neurobiology. I never heard of a meta-analysis until recently, until I got into nutrition. And one reason is that in 1970, there weren't any. Uh, in 1980, uh, there were 50. Uh, in 1900, there were 100. This is a logarithmic scale, so these are uh, the exponents. And uh, uh, then there were 300. Then there were 1,000, and then there were uh, 3,000, and in 2014, there were 10,000 meta-analysis studies in the literature. And if you extrapolate back to 1970, you see it is actually zero. This is an example of spontaneous generation. The, uh, the process uh, grew by itself. Uh, now, I'll just uh, try to quickly show you what's wrong with this and, and then try to fix things. What, what they're doing here is taking a whole bunch of studies, they're looking at the odds ratio, and they're averaging them to get that thing in the diamond. Now, what that's showing is that all, uh, all of the odds ratios on the right side of the figure, uh, in, in this case, uh, they're studying beta blockers, are worse with a beta blocker. All the things on the left are better with a beta blocker, and they say, on average, it's better. But you, here you need to know a t technical fact, and that is the statistical rule. If the error bar, those are the horizontal lines, if that crosses one, there's no statistical difference. So uh, all of these things don't cross the line. None of these are any good. So how you can uh, average a bunch of wrongs and get something statistically significant is hard to understand. So a, a meta-analysis, uh, if you plot them out, they'll show you whether the uh, different studies are roughly consistent. And if they are, that's what you know. You know what you did before you went to the library. But uh, averaging them won't give you any more information than you had before. And, but if they're different, you know, if the study, as in the previous one, if the studies are really different, uh, I tell you by analogy the example of an emerging country building a railroad. Should they use a gauge that matches the country to the north or the country to the south? Well, the parliament votes for a gauge that's the average of the two. And uh, the worst is the uh, coconut study. And they want to tell you that the most important studies on dietary fat and cardiovascular disease, a meta-analysis with two studies that worked and two that didn't. So. Uh, that sort of speaks for itself. So how are you going to fix it? Well, I'm going to tell you by analogy this about a, a uh, NYPD uh, officer who was involved in convicting uh, a criminal and later decided that he was actually innocent and was involved in uh, uh, helping uh, get him released. And the main idea is he said he had doubts about the work of the NYPD. And what he s thought was wrong is that the investigation stopped at after the arrest. And whereas he preferred, uh, he, he later went to work with a federal agency where they kept investigating until there was a trial. And that's what we really need. Uh, we, the, uh, uh, the bottom line is uh, that we can't stop 
reviewing the paper after it's published. There has to be post-publication review, and the original publication has to be much more tentative. And this is just, I uh, just have, a, um, almost done here, these are just a couple examples of responsible people with good credentials who made real criticisms to uh, published papers, and those have to be considered. So what we really need is a, a two different levels of acceptance of published papers. They have to be published and then subject to continued review. So the bottom line is we're using the wrong model. You know, we're, we're really talking about uh, physics where uh, you get a number that is a real number and you know who the experts are in the field and although they don't always agree, they do agree on methodology. So, and in, uh, in medicine and especially nutrition, they're more tentative and more controversial than in the physical sciences. Uh, Post-publication review before final exception, all voices have to be heard. Until then, we have a rule. Editors have to recognize a uh, controversial manuscript and they have to appoint reviewers on both sides of the controversy. If they don't do that, that constitutes de facto or intentional bias. That's it. Thanks. It seems to me meta-analysis is a lazy way to do research because all you have to do is have an adding machine. You don't have to do anything original. You just add numbers together and you got a paper. And it, yeah. se it seems to me the big push to turn out papers is one reason meta-analysis is accepted even though it should not be. Thou hast said it. And well, yeah, you don't have to do an experiment. Uh, well, where it really comes from it is that if you have a, a couple of small studies and they're underpowered, which means they don't have a, a large enough uh, <coughs> number of subjects to really draw a conclusion, you can try to merge them and hope that a pattern will come out. But in doing that, you have to recognize that it's a last ditch Hail Mary kind of uh, approach. You may see something or you may not. Uh, but these are all big, uh, well-controlled studies, and, and you're not going to get anything by averaging them. And uh, this is one of the principles in the medical literature that I uh, object to strongly, is they have the idea that the larger the study, that that makes it inherently better. And uh, because of time uh, restraints, I, didn't, I have a proof that a larger N is not necessarily better. Uh, had the video of 10,000 Japanese singing Beethoven's Ninth Ode to Joy. And you can see it on YouTube. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's pretty good, actually, but uh, somebody made the comment that all they could think of was all the buses in the parking lot. Anyway, yes, sir. Thank you, that was really interesting. I was just wondering if off the top of your head you know of any books I could read that are at a basic level to keep learning about this? Uh, about the statistics? About statistics and how to interpret data, but nothing too advanced. Well, I'm trying to write stuff myself. I have oh. stuff on my blog, and, and okay. uh, all the bloggers are good at it. Uh, I know Rob Wolf. Uh, well, we're publishing a paper along these lines, and one of my co-authors said that uh, my talk was a complicated way of uh, doing what Rob Wolf did simply, so uh, uh, hard to please everybody. But uh, no, it's tough. I mean, the, th the thing about uh, what, what you have to know going in there is that, that you can trust your common sense. Now, a good statistics book will say something along the lines of what we do in statistics is we try to put a number on our intuition. By intuition, they mean our experience with the biology. You know, we, we try to ask ourselves, I, I understand this uh, group of people, I understand the reliability of the independent variable, how much they eat. And 
I understand that they're real different. You know, uh, the first five people who came in were all completely different. What measure can I use uh, that will bring out the differences? So, for example, uh, we published a paper where we said, don't do anything till you, you're sure that th maybe they really are different. And so what we did is we took, uh, this was a weight loss study, and we took the data and we subtracted the uh, weight loss on the, uh, uh, well, we took the, all of the weight loss on all the low-fat diets, and we put them across a uh, horizontal line. And we took all the weight losses on the low-carb diet, we put them down the side. And then we made a, uh, a matrix, we made a, uh, uh, a grid, and each of the grid elements were the difference between the low-carb and the uh, low-fat. And then we color-coded it. And you could look at it, you can eyeball it, and you can see that in, in the particular experiment that all of the big red ones were drifting in the direction of the low carb. Now that's not, uh, that's making an assumptions too. It's always, uh, again, as we said, there's no uh, absolute biology and statistics. But wh what it was saying is, if these people are really different, uh, then let's see what the overall effect of this diet is. And, and it suggested that in this particular group that the low-carb diet was way better uh, by the eyeball test. Uh, it didn't mean that you couldn't do a more sophisticated analysis. The, the analysis we did uh, emphasized all the differences. It, it brought out all the differences between the, the people. Uh, the limitation of more common statistics is that it emphasizes uh, it, 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 uh, it gives up on uh, differences for reliability, so it smooths everything out. And so you have to make a balance between those two. So the answer to your question is, I, I don't really know the answer. The statistics books uh, tend to be uh, too heavy duty. I, I can't understand them. Yeah, he's uh, pretty good. He's. Um, you, re you recommended him. Yeah, he he's written. I I forgot because I had uh, this. Um, uh, uh, the reason I'm hesitating is I I haven't looked at his stuff in a while, but he he has a lot of stuff on uh, the internet and and it does uh, uh, try to get down to earth. Well, actually, that's the place to look, is you look on YouTube, and you look on uh, people that are trying to make it simple. And remember, it's your money, you're the consumer. If, if you're not into it in five minutes, it's the wrong guy. You've got to go to the next YouTube. But, uh, <laughs> well, it's hard to shop for that uh, commodity. It's, uh, you know, n it's very hard to get people to tell you the simple average down-to-earth parts of statistics without uh, drowning you in complexity. And uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, actually, uh, I, I did try to, uh, we published a paper showing that intention to treat uh, was useless. And of course, it was turned down by a lot of journals because it was threatening people who were using intention to treat. And somebody suggested that I get a, a statistician on the paper. And so I called Dalal because he was even more critical of the intention to treat. But um, I remember somehow we couldn't get along. So I just published it myself. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it was good to see somebody who was uh, uh, even more annoyed by intention to treat than I was. So. Okay, thank you. Yes, last question. Thank you for a wonderful talk and for making some excellent points. Um, I think another thing that often gets missed in a lot of the nutrition literature is the idea that even if we're, try if we're trying to isolate a particular variable or, you know, in, in the posted, um, the effect of consuming meat, we're not considering also the effect of people that, are, that aren't eating that meat, what are they eating in place of that? And even 
randomized control trials have this problem of testing the effect of eliminating a certain food without necessarily recognizing what people are replacing it with or vice versa. And you know, given, given the complexity of diet and the fact that there's so much variation that happens with what we eat, what we're eating it with, and interactions within those, and then interactions with lifestyle variables, and given just you know, the messiness of nutritional data, of observational data, would you, I mean, in moving forward and trying to answer these questions of what are the real health effects of eating meat versus other foods, would you just throw out all, I mean, discourage observational studies, period? Or is there a place for observational studies? And how would you suggest, if so, doing a better job at getting at these complex relationships and nuances? Uh, well, the, uh, what I would suggest is that whatever study you do, you uh, have a certain degree of modesty and uh, analyze what you're really, uh, what you're really finding there. I, I mean, uh, I, I think that we, we need to think about going forward, but certainly the idea that we would throw out 80% of the epidemiologic studies is unreliable. Uh, it's not impossible. Uh, I, I would tell you, yeah, well, you'll notice I listed all these confounders. This is red meat. You didn't find in those confounders uh, the amount of carbohydrate. So there's a big difference between having a red uh, a roast beef sandwich and having a roast beef uh, lettuce wrap. And, uh, but th the problem is in the science. It's, it's not just the methodology. Uh, and I think the only way to get at this, uh, because the, the uh, establishment position is dense on the biology, we, we uh, have to show that this kind of methodology is not good. A and big N is not good, uh, because th the bigger the N, the more the variability, the more you lose track of the subjects. Uh, you know, we don't know the answer on uh, a diet, but the extent to which we think that a, a low carbohydrate diet might be preferable for people with a metabolic syndrome is not from the big studies. It's from uh, work done by Jeff Volick, for example, where he has 40 subjects, and the low carb people are way different than the uh, low-fat people. You know, there's just, uh, it's not a judgment call. And we, we also have standards. I mean, what's wrong with the medical literature is that they uh, uh, don't have clear standards. They have arbitrary rules, like a big N is better. Uh, but Bradford Hill, Bradford Hill is the guy who did the uh, cigarette smoking lung cancer study. And he's published a, a a really excellent list of nine criteria that ask the question, when is an observational study really likely to be causal? And he gave nine criteria. He was very explicit. It's worth uh, digging up his presidential address because it's, it's beautifully written. It's relatively short. Uh, and he was explicit that these aren't hard and fast rules. They're uh, extensions of common sense. And the first thing that he said was he looks for big changes. And that does not mean an odds ratio of 1.5. Uh, it means big changes. And for example, I, uh, the, the particular study that I'm thinking of that Volek did, everybody, half of the people in the low carb uh, group were better than uh, the average in the low fat group. Uh, and the, uh, no, I'm sorry, half of the people in the, in the low carb group were better than anybody in uh, the low fat group. So half the people were what you might consider outliers. And that tells you something. I mean, that tells you, it doesn't tell you that the number that he came up with is an accurate number. You don't, as you say, there are too many variables. But, it, but the, the eyeball test tells you that if it's wrong, it's not way wrong. And that's got to be the first criterion. Is it, uh, 
is it a big number? And the second criteria is, it, does it make biological sense? It doesn't make sense that red meat is going to cause diabetes. It, uh, and uh, I, I would just add one technical point on this, which is never brought up in the analysis of these studies, is that the statistics uh, in this particular study are what's called two-tailed. What that means is that you're asking which of two things is better. Uh, and therefore, in a 60-40 outcome, you may be, have a 60% chance of getting better. But if you don't get better, you're going to get worse, because you don't know which is the good thing, having red meat or not having red meat. A lot of people, especially the elderly, don't get enough red meat. Uh, so uh, in other words, if you think of the uh, lung cancer study, not everybody who smokes get lung, gets lung cancer. And, and the ones uh, who don't are immune or uh, have other biological features or whatever. But nobody thinks that smoking keeps you from getting lung cancer. But you don't know that with red meat, because we don't know enough about it. It may keep you from getting uh, diabetes. So that's a very important uh, result. And it, and it makes the results even more vague. 